Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Marina Ponti, the director of the UN SDG Action Campaign, and I'm delighted to be here today for a special climate edition of the Turning Point Dialogues. We have seen in the past weeks the incredible mobilization for the Sustainable Development Goals as world leaders convene at the General Assembly to tackle the challenges of our times. The mobilization was calling for a change in direction. What we define, turn it around, to protect our planet and future generation opportunities while addressing the deep inequalities that affect our societies. And now we are at another very important point in time. In a few weeks, leader will meet again in Glasgow and a movement is building to make sure in the words of the UN Secretary General that we make peace with nature. We must act now to tackle climate change and make sure that the trillion dollar pandemic recovery packages lead to green, inclusive and just outcomes. So today we will be focusing on the responses that are needed from the global community in key areas, including community resilience and adaptation. I'm delighted to be joined by Fahed Aldehimi, who is a member of the Climate Change Working Group at the Qatar Fund for Development and works across both development and humanitarian aid. Welcome, Fahed. Thank you for being here. And let me now welcome back Mitzi Tan, the convener of You Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, someone who's living and breathing the climate realities in a part of the world where the climate crisis is undeniable. Hi, Mitzi. Welcome both. So I'll, I'll first uh, um, have my, my question to Fahed. We are here to talk about the power and opportunity of this moment as a turning point for people and for planet. Fahed, I understand you work to enhance community resilience in small island states and least developed countries through mitigation and adaptation strategies. From this perspective, what do you see as the most pressing obstacle that need to be overcome to enable resilience building and successful adaptation in this country? Thank you very much, Farina. Uh, thanks for such a kind introduction. Um, I think firstly, when we, we look at it from a political level, it's obvious to us that more funding and attention is required. Uh, of, of course, we've seen increased attention and funding over the past decade, but unfortunately, the needs are growing faster than we can really keep up with. Um, in relation to the fund, I think at a, a more localized perspective, we're, we really see one of the most critical challenges is inclusion. Um, and I've found through conversations with affected individuals that uh, oftentimes the people most vulnerable uh, to climate risks are uh, often those who are unaware of the true risks of climate change. And uh, even in the cases where they are aware, uh, often they feel like they don't really have a voice in the conversation. So I think for us, it's kind of critical to ensure that these high vulnerability populations have the sort of financial, technical and institutional resources they need to be able to adapt and, and really give them that voice. Um, so, so here, I think it's, it's kind of critical to mention the importance of women's and girls inclusion at this stage um, to be able to promote change and peace um, which is a critical focus for us because, of course, uh, it seems clear that the, the more inclusion and empowerment that we have of the most vulnerable, the more actors we really have to be able to drive action to reduce climate uh, change. So I, I think the sort of underlying story for me here is we have to kind of ensure that people have not only a voice, but also a hand in being able to really address the causes and the effects of climate change. Thank you, Fahed. I think you, you narrow down two very important points. 
you mentioned the lack of adequate funding, which I think is uh, it's something uh, many many glo global leaders have also underlined, and many uh, organizations and movement, including the Friday for Future. So we need resources, and also we need uh, inclusion. We need everyone to sit at the table, particularly those who are most affected by climate change and they do uh, pay the impact and the consequences, but they are not involved in finding the solution. So I think the issue of including community, including women, including indigenous um, population, young people. So thank you for raising this point. And I think it's a, it's a perfect league way to, to ask the same question to Mitzi. Uh, you know, you are young, you're a young woman, you are an advocate and, and you live in a country that is very affected, you know, by climate change. So what do you see as the as the main obstacle that we need to tackle today? Just as Fahad mentioned, it's really that lack of awareness and education that empowers people to act. So as he mentioned, people who are most vulnerable, usually the information about the climate crisis is kept away from them. And because of that, we're not able to push and demand for more from our governments and from world leaders also. And so we're not able to adapt. And with the systems of injustice and profit oriented system that we have today, that's so focused on the over exploitation of human rights and, and resources and workers in the global south and the everlasting quote unquote profit of the global north, we end up having countries where we're not able to adapt and industrialize. For example, the tip of this. Um, the tip of this pen, we can't create this. We can't, we can't have this in the Philippines. So how are we supposed to create solar panels and transition from the fossil fuel industry into a green energy? That's, and that, that is how you adapt. And how are we supposed to do that if we can't even have these industrialized um, models here in our countries? And a big reason we don't have that is because as I had mentioned, the funding. A lot of climate finance is usually, um, as band-aid solutions, I would say, when there are climate impacts, which are so important, but so much of it, majority of climate finance comes in the forms of loans. And so we go into debt for having to deal with the impacts of the climate crisis that we didn't even cause. So this is one huge challenge, which is all just rooted in the system that's constantly prioritizing the profit of the few over the benefit of the majority. Thank you, Missy. I, I think you, you really pointed out to, to what many people call the climate injustice, because climate is also deeply linked to, to the deep in inequalities and also the unequal distribution of opportunities, power and technology or, you know, copyright uh, or today vaccine uh, that exists in our community. But uh, we are, you know, in a few weeks, uh, the COP will gather, you know, leaders. So we need to give a vision and, and maybe give some, um, some strategy or some proposal that you would like leaders to really act upon to accelerate process. So which will be, uh, which is your vision of, of, the, of the few things that need to happen now at Glasgow, you know, to make a difference and turn it around? Mitzi, first to you now. It's really simple, actually. It's basically just listening to what the scientists and what the people have been saying, giving support to those most marginalized. How does this look concretely? Some ways are to make sure that we have drastic emission cuts, especially in this COP26, where carbon budget is going to be a heavy topic. It's so important that people from the global south most impacted are able to attend this COP26. And then there's also the, the topics of loss and damages and reparations and understanding that the global north isn't supposed to give money as solidarity, quote unquote. It's supposed to be there you're supposed to give that money because you caused the climate crisis. Framing it as a solidarity fund erases the accountability of these countries that caused the climate crisis. And they can't, they've already pledged a 100 billion US dollar solidarity fund that until now they haven't been able to come up with. And it's nowhere near enough what's actually happening in our country. So really focusing on reparations and loss and damages and debt cancellation, especially for debts that are caused by um, loaning to 
mitigate the impacts of the climate crisis, those are things that shouldn't be um, debts that we shouldn't have to pay because the reason it's happening is because of the global north. And I think that is something that we really need to look at, especially with COP26. And as you mentioned, with vaccine inequity, making things difficult, we really have to come together and push that this conference of parties is one where people are actually represented and included. Thank you, Mitzi. So I think you, I like your, your clarity. So we need to listen. Everybody needs to listen to, to science and what science is telling us and has been telling us, you know, I think for many decades, we need to address the issues of loss and, um, and, and also fairness. And, and those, who, uh, those, those regions and those government and those country who have actually created the issue, they need to repay. And, and, and they need to restore what they have damaged because we have one planet and, and we should all somehow protect it together. So I, I think there is a very important issue about uh, an equal uh, responsibility you know, in the climate uh, crisis. So we need to really increase the resources when we are the global north are creating the problem and also access to technology, access to uh, different solutions that, uh, that allow uh, for investment, not just, uh, as you said, in putting band-aid to the problem, but investing in the transition towards renewable energy and towards uh, you know, a, a new e ecological system. So I think this is where the resources need to be you know, for such a, an important transition. So now, uh, back to you, Fahed, uh, you know, a few weeks away from, from COP, what, what's your vision of things that could be achieved and could be asked to leaders to deliver? I, I think I, I really couldn't uh, agree with Mitzi anymore. Uh, it, the, the key challenge that, that we see is ensuring, again, harking back to my, my first answer, this sort, sort of inclusive approach to tackling climate change. Um, and Carter Fund for Developments recently uh, developed a 10-year strategy. And this strategy really focuses, it's got a human-centric focus, uh, which includes this sort of focus on the global self, uh, self uh, and the voices of the global self, um, and, and focusing really hard on sort of grassroots projects, because of, of course, people know best the challenges that face them. Um, not only that, I think it's it's critical because it sort of ensures ownership and buy-in from those individuals, which is the only way we can really ensure sustainability in the work that we're doing. Uh, and, and to kind of uh, complement one of Mitzi's comments is that some of the programming we're looking at, we, we've recently established a, a green entrepreneurships network, um, which focuses on growing homegrown entrepreneurial solutions. Uh, and of course, we don't want to give extra loans. We don't want to make people more indebted. So our focus was really on giving a 10 year revolving fund, looking into the future where we will be engaged far past the sort of project level. And I think this is the way that COP needs to be looking. We need an inclusive COP. We need to ensure that the breadth of voices are heard. Firstly, that includes the voices of the most vulnerable, uh, as we discussed, and, and making sure that the global self really does have a voice. But also, I think we, uh, uh, speaking on behalf of the fund now, I think we as non-traditional donors have a really critical role to play. Firstly, in offering sort of novel perspectives, uh, but also on delivering uh, on these perspectives. It's not just about talking. We really have to be delivering, as, as Mitzi said, to, to kind of uh, address these root causes of climate change. Um, and it's critical for us because, I mean, many of us exist in severe climates already. So, so it's, it's really close to home. And I think this was sort of uh, the thinking behind His Highness Chef Tamim bin Hamad Thani's $100 million pledge at the uh, Climate Action Summit in 2019, where it was really our goal, not just to engage in dialogue, but to really back up our dialogue with um, solid action. 
Thank you, Fahed. I think you, you made a very good point about the inclusion of, of different voices from, uh, from the Global South, but also from different groups, indigenous, young people, and the communities that are affected by, by the impact of climate. And, and you also, I think, remind you know, global leaders uh, that they need to you know, put, the, put the money where, where they, where they um, you know, have committed. So we, we just don't want any more pledges. We just want the delivery of, um, you know, of the promises. So now for the people, you know, watching us uh, from everywhere and, and the people watching us want to be part of the solution, want to help. So what will be an actionable, you know, a call to action for them to take from home, from wherever they are, to support the movement towards COP? Mitzi. There are several ways to do this. One of them would be to make COP and climate a dinner table conversation, make it normal to talk about these things so that we raise awareness with our peers, with our families, and we start pressuring world leaders together. Um, a more concrete way is on November 5th and 6th, during the Conference of Parties 26, um, there will be protests across the world um, of course, there will be one in Glasgow. If you're there, then please come over and join us. But it will be across the world and there will be online initiatives also. We really need to come together as one community, as one planet to resist and to fight climate injustice. Thank you, Mitzi. And we all noted down the 5th and 6th of November, you know, to join the movement. Um, Fahed, a call to action from your perspective. You know, I think uh, Mitzi covers the the sort of human and um, personal perspective really well. Maybe I can speak at, at a more political uh, angle. And I think that a lot of the conversations that we've had today and the work that we've done um, is really focused on climate adaptation. And I think if I've got one message, it's that mitigation is key. Um, as donor agencies, we must focus on sort of innovative funding aimed at addressing the root causes of climate change. Uh, and not only that, but critically introducing mitigation methods across all of our projects and programs, um, which, which we've tried to do here as much as possible at QFFD, and it's uh, an ongoing process, but really streamlining climate mitigation across our education, health, and economic development programming. So I think in a nutshell, we shouldn't really be focused so much on learning to live with climate change, but we should really devote our focus and our actions on limiting and countering global warming and climate change. Thank you, Fahed. So adaptation, but also mitigation, it really should be a priority across uh, you know, policy and investment. So we're coming to the end, uh, now the last question, which is my favorite question. So I start with you, Fahed. Um, we, you know, we, we're seeing people inspiring us every day, but today we want to know from you, what has inspired you to become a climate champion? Was a poet, an idea, a person, a book? Tell us. Thanks. It's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, I think my, my interest in, in general in international development sort of stemmed from coming from a really mi mixed cultural background, being half Qatari and half South African, uh, and also spending a lot of my youth living around the world, including in, in many developing countries. And so I think really critical to that, uh, and the big driving factor in this was Probably most importantly, my mum, because she she really didn't shelter us from any of the realities of existence. Um, we grew up with a strong understanding of the inequalities that were surrounding us. And I think this sort of really drove my passion for cultural understanding and wanting to build better societies. And it, the link with climate change seems really clear to me because being sort of our biggest existential threat regardless of culture, class, race, gender, I think I was sort of naturally drawn towards the cause. Thank you, Fahed. Thank you. Mitzi, back to you. What has inspired you? For me, it's kind of similar that I grew up being exposed to this. Um, 
So my family has always been very close to the environment, but also I did see the typhoons constantly growing up. But because, again, the way climate education and awareness was taught was so disempowering and, and even sometimes wrong in the way they taught it, I didn't realize how we had to fight back until much later on when I was able to talk to an indigenous leader of our land. And he was telling us about how they were being harassed and displaced and killed and militarized. And with the Philippines being the third most dangerous country in the world for environmental defenders, it all really hit home. But then what really got to me was how after he said all of that, he shrugged, he chuckled. And so simply, he said, that's why we have no choice but to fight back. And that's when I realized that he was right. We have no choice but to fight back. It's our planet. It is our lives. It is our community. We have to join the fight for climate justice. Thank you, Mitzi. So let me end with this uh, uh, very powerful sentence. There's no choice. We need to fight back. And, and actually, let's hope and work together to have a, a very successful COP in Glasgow. And to, to the people watching home, thank you for, for, this, uh, for being part of this conversation. And stay tuned for more Turning Point Dialogues on Climate as we go closer to Glasgow. Thank you.